right. Thank you everyone for coming to the November HEAC Home uh, Education Advisory Council meeting. Uh, we will call this meeting to order at 2.34 p.m. And we will begin with a roll call vote um, because we did choose to allow members to attend uh, electronically, remotely. And so uh, if a member is attending remotely, just a reminder until we get used to this, um, they must state the reason why physical attendance is not necessarily, is not reasonably practical. And that should be stated in the minutes. Um, identify the persons present in the location from which the member is participating and be able to contemporaneously and throughout the meeting see and hear and be seen and heard by the other members of the council. And we need to do a call vote. So with that, we'll begin the roll call vote. Uh, Althea. I am present. There is no one in the room and I am remote due to family obligations. Thank you. Okay, um, Mike. Present. Thank you. And Diane. Present. Rebecca. Present. Senator Ward. I'm here. <laughs> okay, and April Volani is also present. Um, at this time, um, we not uh, attending is Representative Kutab, uh, Representative uh, Petternell. Representative Petternell did let me know she was um, out of town and unable to attend. Um, Jill, who does have intentions of attending, so we may see her remote in later. Um, and and Heather Barker, who had who was attending on attending, but then she had an emergency today. So um, with that, we do have a quorum and we can proceed with our meeting. So thank you all. I'd also like to say just a general thank you to everyone for responding to your RSVPs. You guys have been great and everyone for being here. So um, the next item on our agenda is the agenda review. Does anyone have anything you'd like to add to the agenda or change on the agenda? Um, Tim, is this where we bring up the thing we were talking about? It's up to you. It's a, okay. Um, you know, the council, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, district communication. Yeah. Oh, sorry. May I ask okay. that people state their names because I cannot see on Zoom. I cannot <laughs> see who's speaking. It's just oh, a I blurred see. screen. So yeah, the owl's not cooperating. <laughs> sorry, I'm being. That's all right. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to bug you. Sorry. No problem. Thank you for making sure we're doing what we can so our minutes are accurate, Althea. Um, district communication um, on student withdrawal when um, we're getting notification. I'm not sure how to phrase that. Okay. So student notification. Yes. All right. Where do you where would you like to discuss that in the agenda, Mike? Anywhere. Your your choice. And who is speaking, please? Oh, that sorry. I'm sorry. That was just sorry. April asking where is there a preferred place that to talk about notification? And who who made the request? Mike. Mike. Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, we did talk about that in last business. Would you like to yes. put it under continuing business? Sure. Yes. Okay. So we'll add 9A uh, notification requirements. Yeah. Is that appropriate? Okay. Any other request? Okay. Hearing none, we'll go on to item number three, minutes of the previous meeting. Um, back before us, you'll see the May 19th, uh, minutes. This is coming back before us because I made a typo and I'm so grateful that Althea caught that typo. Thank you, Althea. Um, the minutes were posted. Um, it, it was in that five-day time frame that Althea brought this to our attention. 
to my attention. However, the minutes I believe were already posted on the website. So just to make sure we're all in communication, I touched base with Tim. Liz said it is something that we could change. So back before you um, is the May minutes. And in the last paragraph, page six, line 13, the sentence beginning if drafts notes and memoranda contains an extra not. And that sentence should actually read if drafts notes and memoranda or other documents not in their final for, form, and this is where we need to exclude that second not disclosed, circulated or made available to a quorum or a majority of the members of a public body and retained after the public body or agency has approved final minutes. They will be subject to inspection. So does anyone have any thoughts or concerns? about bringing that before. And if not, could we have a motion to uh, approve the amended minutes with correcting the typo for May 19th? And, and the one that you have with you is, so you, you'll see like this notes, why the typo identified and the Second one you'll see actually has the typo already corrected. All right. So if you're a little like you were looking for it, Rebecca. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have the old one. <laughs> okay. I can't check in my head. Oh, sorry. Hi, Jill. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. So it's 2 40. Um, we'll make a note that Jill has now joined the meeting. Thank you, Jill. Uh, Jill, just as a note for members who um, attend remotely, they need to state the reason why physical attendance is not reasonably practical, um, and that must be stated in the minutes, identify the persons present in the location from which the member is participating, and be able to contemporaneously and throughout the meeting see and hear and be seen or heard by the other members of the council, and we must take roll call votes. So would you kindly identify if there's anyone else in the location and the reason why it's not practical for you to be here in person? So I'm in my office at school. There is no one else here in the office with me and I cannot attend due to um, responsibilities that I have after school today uh, or after this meeting today that precluded me from coming to Concord. Thank you, Jill, I appreciate that. Sure, you're welcome. So would anyone like to make a motion that we correct the minutes to remove the typo? Sure. I make that motion. Okay, who is that? Who? Althea? Okay. So the first is Althea and a second? My second. second. Rebecca? Rebecca. Okay. All right, any other discussion? Hearing none on a roll call vote. Jill. So, so Jill's nodding. So that's a yes, Jill? Yes. Okay. Yes, that is a, yes. sure. Okay. Uh, Mike. Yes. Diane. Yes. Rebecca. Yes. Althea. Yes. Great. And I'm a yes. All right. Great. Thank you, guys. All right, moving on. Next minutes are the minutes from the September 15th meeting. Any comments or suggestions? I did notice one because I made an error in the meeting. Um, and I think that's why it's in the notes. On page three of the minutes, the third paragraph from the bottom, it says, Representative Kutab joined the meeting at 4.04 p.m. I actually made a mistake during the meeting and I called Representative Petterdale, Representative Kutab. And so um, I'm going to ask, can we remove that? Because that was just my human error and Representative Kutab was not here. I had just looked up. So I'm still trying to navigate with you guys and get to know the familiar faces. So I'm just, that's the only correction that I noticed. 
Does anyone else have anything for September 15th? Hearing none, do we have any motions for the minutes of approving the minutes of September 15th? I motion that we approve the minutes of September 15th. With the correction? With the correction. Okay, so Rebecca just made um, a motion to accept the minutes of September the 15th with the correction. Do we have a second? second. I'll second. Okay, I heard Diane first, so we'll go with Diane. Okay, any other discussion? Hearing none on a roll call vote. Mike? Yes. Diane? Yes. Rebecca? Yes. Out the end. Yes. And Jill? Yes. Thank you. And I'm also a yes. So those minutes are um, will be corrected and then sent to be posted. Thank you all. And the next item on our agenda is public comment. Uh, Tim, would you kindly be our, yes. our timekeeper if we need it? Sure. And there, nobody signed in, but I do see an MC Anders is on the remotely. Right. Um, did you have a public comment, MC Anders? Nope. So do we know if that's, um, sometimes I've heard there's a problem when you call in, you have to select certain buttons. Do we know if that's a, there's not, if they're not. Hey, showing, it's, 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 no oh, perfect. Okay. Okay. okay exactly. Thank you Thank so you much. much. Okay. So there's no public comment at this time. So we'll go ahead and move ahead to item number five, immediate business, a meeting day and time for the current year. That's something that the council spoke about last meeting right. that they would like to address going forward. So I'll open that up for discussion. Let's see, as of right now, our next meeting, we typically are meeting the the third Friday at 2.30. And uh, in the past, we elected to do that so that our legislators could attend right. with us. Right. Um, and we, it was voiced that we do not want to meet on major religious holidays moving forward. And at present, our next scheduled meeting would be December 15th, if needed. Uh, and then after that would be January 19th. Okay. What was that December day? December 15th if needed. Are there any religious holidays on a Friday for next year? That would be a problem. Do we know? I, I have not done the research <laughs> on that. Does anyone know if there's any religious holidays coming up next year on Friday? Um, well, there are often um, Jewish religious holidays on Fridays. Start that start on Fridays, Friday afternoons. So I think that was part of the discussion at the last meeting. Would someone uh -huh. like to do um, the volunteer, right, to do the research in, into if there's any? I'll do that. Okay, thank you, Rebecca, um, for this, this meeting year. And if so, bring that forward at our next meeting. So Rebecca has volunteered to research the religious holidays for this, our current meeting schedule. Yes, Tim. Uh, so Althea, Tim Carney, um, Department of Ed, just so you're aware, if you wanted to change a single meeting, as long as we do proper notice, you could easily do that as well. So okay. um, if it's just, you don't want to change it. There, the meeting time today for the entire year, you could just do a single meeting and move that as you wish. And, and I can do the proper notice for that. Thank you. I appreciate okay. that. Yeah. Any other discussion about the meeting day and time for this current year? Okay, hearing none, we'll move to 5B, the best practices review.
So we have um, the first page that you guys all have are the best practices that we have adopted. The second page looks a little bit different. Um, it has the working draft on there. The other thing is there's a notation in yellow to the left if we have proposals on things. Um, it, I think it would be helpful as we go through this, if there's something that we know we don't wanna keep looking at meeting to meeting that just doesn't fit this group, we could go ahead and strike that from the working document if you if it's the council's pleasure. So that would be helpful to know too as we continue on this. So the first one that- um, Excuse that me, April? A, I'm, hi, sorry yes, to, I'm sorry to interrupt. Is that no. a paper document that you circulated or is, yes. was that? Okay, and was well, that no, circulated? It's in the, I'm sorry, Althea. It's in the meeting materials that okay. was emailed. Okay, I apologize. Um, I'm going to pull it up then. Sure. If it's helpful, Althea, it was in this. There's two documents that were attached. It's in one of them and not both of them. So okay. um, it's the one that has the 11 pages and not the shorter one. Right. The beginning part was the same. Is that right? Correct. Um, Correct. Okay. Thank you. If you guys want to give it the a thumbs up when you're ready and you have that digital copy, that'd be helpful. So we want you to make sure you have it before we move forward into this discussion. Yep. Just a second, just scrolling through. Okay, I've got it. Okay, great. Jill, you're all set as well? Excellent, thank you. Okay, so um, did, would anyone, is there any particular, item that you guys would like to bring up for discussion? On um, number three, when is that mm -hmm. annual draft report typically done and when is it due and who does it go to? That's a great question. Um, the annual report is actually presented to the State Board of Education and um, and I'm looking at you guys who have been here longer than I have on this board. Um, that typically happens towards the end of the session year. We It's brought before the council and the council discusses it, makes any changes, is, changes, and then when it's approved, then we, then the chair, vice chair, uh, present it to the State Board of Education. So this typically, I think the past couple of years have been done in the summer. Yeah. And that is something that is, that we're required to do by the rules of, to present that report. That's the legislative year then you said? Um, academic year? Do you think yeah, that's fair yeah. to say? I think it's fair, okay. to, say. I think okay. it's fair to say academic year. And okay. Yes. I didn't know if there was a hard and fast due date. No, there. I don't believe that there is. But typically, I know the past couple of years, it's been um, after that the final meeting session that um, we've asked to, can we get on the State Board of Education agenda in order to present it to them? Mm -hmm. And that is something that's done in writing. So there's actually, it's not just a verbal report. There is a prepared written report. I think there is a. I'm sorry, Diane. May is typically the last meeting of Kia. Is that what you mean? Um, so, he act, I mean, number one on our best practices does say, I mean, September through June. If for some reason something happened and we didn't get it in June, this is a best practice. It's not hard and fast. We would need to meet in order to have that report yeah. approved. Yeah. Is there anything that you guys would like to see as far as proposals come off of this working draft? I kind of went back through um, our minutes because Liz Brown, um, Elizabeth Brown, attorney Brown, who is legal counsel for the New Hampshire Department of Education, 
Um, we in our minutes from January 20th of 2023. Um, it is recorded that Liz Brown stated the attorney general's advice is to use caution in adopting policies because problems can arise if they are not followed carefully and they can create record keeping issues. She recommended that any needed policies be kept simple, short, concise, understandable, published and transparent, and that they be reviewed periodically by a lawyer to ensure they're consistent with state law and possibly conduct an annual council member sign off that policies have been read and acknowledged. Discussed effective ways of transferring knowledge to successors without written policies slash procedures, including keeping a simple running list of actions taken by the HEAC and noting that actions will be consistent with RSA. So I just bring that up because if you weren't here for that meeting or on the council at that time, it's just nice to know what attorney Brown did advise the council. Now, will she be reviewing these? Do we, does Brown need to review these best practices that we adopt? Um, let me see. If, Tim, I'm gonna to refer to you on that because in these minutes, part of it says on page two, if the HEAC required, oh, that's for non-public. If the HEAC required an attorney for a legal issue in non-public session, or if HEAC pursued, the matter would be referred to the New Hampshire Attorney General's office. Yep. But if we just needed someone to look over to make sure these are all in compliance with certain right. like current statutes, right. Would we be able to ask if there's... I can ask. Okay, yeah. we can yeah. ask. We don't know what the answer yeah. would be, but we right. can ask. Yeah. I don't want to speak for her. Right. I, okay. I've learned my lesson. But... Sure, okay. So we could ask. But I yeah. can ask her, okay. yes. Okay. I can do that. Okay. I have an answer. Okay. Bringing that up, is, I mean, after we kind of finished discussing this, would anyone, it'd be interesting if um, maybe there was a proposal to ask if our current adopted best practices be reviewed. Um, okay. So looking at, well, first off, I, I, I personally have a question to, and I'm going to ask Tim, Tim, <laughs> have you heard of the attorney general offering any sort of advice or perhaps Senator Ward regarding, um, the posting of videos? If you have a video meeting, uh, like yeah. that doesn't seem to be. Well, yeah, required, I, but do you have any information about that? Right? Yes, I can speak to that. Okay. Uh, and again, LB, it's Tim Carney with the Department of Education. Um, so this has come up not only here, but I also have the Nonpublic School Advisory Council. And uh, Attorney Brown is engaged with the Attorney General's Office as a whole, um, reviewing this issue of these councils uh, posting uh, videos and if what's the department's role in that, if any. And so last I spoke to Attorney Brown, it would probably this next week, they were going to get together with the Attorney General's office and have this conversation because what I think what the concern is, we're creating content that is subject to right to no requests on the department website, right. where um, HEAC is not a Department of Education entity. It's its own entity. And so should that be on our website or for example, should um, HEAC have their own Zoom account and we would provide access to plug into the wall and, and HEAC would be responsible for posting. So that's where the questions are coming up. And it's not only this council, it's many other councils that are the department and other state agencies are involved with. And okay. so that question has not been answered that's yet. Right. So okay. We're kind of on hold right now because I've asked that question. I think this this council asked the question: yes. Could we post only? Do we have to post video? Could we only post audio? Uh, Could we post a transcript, for example. Right. So when I researched that information, is when I ended up getting back to Liz about this question because our technical right. people were saying it's a legal issue. You have to talk to the attorney, and that's what the response back from Attorney Brown was: said it's a much bigger issue than just EAC as far as posting, because I believe even the 
the state website, um, the state board of education website is the there's a link on the website, but I don't believe it, it's posted on a third party site. Okay. It's hosted, I guess, would be okay. appropriate on a third party site. Okay. Uh, so we have the recording. We respond to 91 A's. There, there's someone who we will ask tomorrow or Monday for the recording, and I will send that to her. And anybody's more than welcome to get a copy of the recording on 91 A. Okay. Um, and it's very informal. I just send it right out. Um, right. And so I don't, I don't wait five days or anything like that. But, right. So the public still has access to it. It's just not as convenient as being posted on a web page. Okay. So I guess I don't have an answer, but I can continue to work with Liz and hopefully by the next meeting, because they are meeting about this next week. Okay. Um, but it is, again, the Attorney General's office, there's a lot of legal um, nuances to this. So I sure. can't guarantee they're gonna give me an answer by the next meeting I can ask and wait for this response. But currently anyone who has Let's say at least for this academic year, who has yeah. requested the video, oh yeah, has received yeah. it exactly. Okay, oh yeah, great, thank you. May I ask a question to clarify? Um, so, um, Tim, you mentioned that if someone asks for the video in the first five days, you will provide it. Once the minutes are drafted and posted, is the video just no longer relevant? Does it? Is it not shared at that point? That is up to the council. So if the purpose, if the council determines, as I understand it, I can confirm with Liz, but as I read 91A, if the council has determined that the purpose of the video is for creating the minutes, um, I've seen in multiple locations where the recommendation has always been to make the video, don't keep the video after the minutes have been posted because the minutes are the official record of a meeting. And so, again, I've seen recommendations elsewhere that once the minutes are complete, if that was the purpose of retaining that video, then that video no longer is needed and it should be eliminated. But again, I would get that clarification from Attorney Brown. Uh, I believe it might actually read that way in 91A, but I'm just going off memory. Yeah. But it's really up to the council if they want to retain that. Okay. Any other discussions about the best practices working document at this time? Yeah, Jim, absolutely. Um, <laughs> when, if, so I am waiting for the council to make this a final document before I put it on our web page. Is that correct? Um, I mean, we do have things that we do have some final decisions. I guess, would it be prudent for the council to ask Attorney Brown to take a look at the best practices that have indeed already been adopted? What do you guys think? Yes. I mean, this is yes. kind of like a work in progress. Yes. yes. I think she should review it before we. Okay. okay. I mean, we don't need a formal that, motion yeah. for that. Like we could just, no, I can as a consensus, just, just right. ask. Okay. Yeah, I, can I agree. Ask that question. Okay. 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 So it seems like we're all in agreement, and it's the one that obviously doesn't have the dot mark. Right. Just the one paper. Right. <laughs> Great. Okay. Any other comments? Concerns? Okay. I mean, it just seems that those, these are, best practices based on already existing best practices. It's not like we're reinventing the wheel. I would agree with that assertion, Jill. The, you know, the difference would be that um, there have been requests to do something above and beyond what's required um, by RSA 91A, and that would really be up to the council as a whole like one council member cannot make that decision we have to make that decision as a council right. makes sense to me yes but you know like we're aware that we're subject to right to know and those disclosures have been made. all right moving ahead we'll go ahead and go to 6a 
rulemaking and legislative updates. The first for A is ED 704.02, the high school equivalency program, admission to testing for home educated students. Do you have any updates on that? So again, Althea Tim Carney, Department of Ed. I did reach out to Sarah Wheeler, uh, the administrator of adult education. She has had no change in that right now in the rulemaking. Okay. And it's simply, it's a matter of priorities in her arena. So. Would it be appropriate for me to do a direct, I mean, I absolutely trust that you're reaching out, so don't take it. Okay. Would it be um, appropriate for me to reach out to Sarah just to try to find out where it is? Because sure. I believe this hasn't been updated since 2013. Mm -hmm. And I think as a council, it would be nice to know kind of a timeline because one of the items we're charged right. with as a right. council um, is to recommend to the commissioner and state board of education desired changes in rules pertaining to home education. Mm -hmm. And granted, this isn't necessarily ED315, it does relate to home educators. Yes. So, um, you know, that might be something would, I mean, would that be appropriate for me to just reach out well, to Sarah? You can always do that. Yeah. Okay. That's, do you need her email address? Do you want me to send I'm sure email? I can get it from the website. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Any other comments or questions about ED 704.02? Um, I, I have a clarifying question because my school is a participating agency. And, um, if I, let's say, for example, had a student who was 16 or 17 years old and they wanted to um, take the high school equivalency test, I would need to sign off on it? Yes. As it's currently in the rules. Not it as it's it. currently in the rules. I'm sorry, Jelda. Because it's not. Yes, you would have. Well, it says we're waiving the requirement for the participating agency to sign off to allow 16 and 17 year old home educated students to take the high school equivalency test. So I, I'm just unclear as to what the objective is. Sure. Because it looks, I it looks like the way that, so to clarify at the bottom um, in italics, is that the current rule, ED 704.02? Yes. That's the current rule. Yeah. Um, so, what? Yes, you do. So, um, there is a disparity, um, discrepancy between home educated students versus um, students in other educational settings. Currently, um, a participating agency would need to sign an attestation for a student in a home education program. However, right now, that's just not compatible with other rules and laws that are on the books. For example, there's a law that a parent can sign off on the student's right to work. This right. parent can also sign off that the student is has completed their home education program. So, you know, the desire is just to make it more compatible with the other rules and laws that the parents have that right without necessarily a third party agency needing that sign off. Because we don't require schools to sign off on the students work permit. We don't require the participating agency to sign off that a student has completed your home education. I see. Okay. So in this case, if a student is um, sent their letter of intent to my school and they wanted to take this high school equivalency test, then I would need to sign off on the request. Um, and we're asking to waive that so that they could just register to take that test without yes. the attestation attestation okay that makes sense okay that's yes I, sorry i didn't realize i need to verbally respond not just <laughs> nod we're getting okay. <laughs> yeah yes. thank you for thank you for clarifying um any other questions or discussion about yeah. edc um, or two mike 
Krasky, I just wanted to add that there's a time element for this, like this is season when students will want to take this. Yes, test. that's the test. So if we could move it along quickly when you, and I do have one thing, Adele did. Sarah Wheeler. When you speak with Sarah, you could you just mention that too? Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. That, yeah, absolutely. Uh, to have this decided by maybe March if possible. Yeah. Well, as we already know from ED315, the rulemaking process yes, does yes. take some time too. So <laughs> right. that may be our desire, but yeah, no, I, I, I practicality. Yeah. But it, it would be nice to know that it's something we would like to see change sooner than later. Yes. Absolutely. Thank and you. who made that suggestion? Mike. Mike, thank you. <laughs> I think that's a that's a great suggestion. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing then we'll move to HB um, 6B, HB 628. Um, although Representative Pedernell is unable to be with us today, she did email an update and I'm happy to read that to the council. Um, here is the update on HB 628 requiring certain non-public schools or education service providers that accept public funds to perform background checks on all employees and volunteers. The bill passed out of the Education Committee with a 10-10 vote of no recommendation. That means the first motion on the House floor will be ought to pass. Representative Tanner offered an amendment that attempted to exclude 193A homeschool programs. However, the language is vague and the amendment also added in additional programs, not specifically EFA funded. This bill includes requiring parents of home educated students receiving education freedom accounts to perform background checks to educate their own children. Individuals can request background checks, but the results can only be sent to a state agency. Mm -hmm. There is no enforcement mechanism to monitor compliance. Non-public schools already require background checks for accreditation, policy, or insurance purposes. And she says she's sorry to meet, miss the meeting. But that was nice that she sent us that update. Mm. So I have a question yeah. about this okay. one, if I may. Yes, Althea. Um, I, I appreciate the work that Tim and others have done in clarifying the home education page. Um, when I reviewed it, uh, it reminded me that Students who are educated under 193A are called home educated students. People who, <laughs> students who are educated under, uh, let's see. And if a family accepts funding from EFA, um, I believe they are no longer under 193A. The HEAC has done a lot of work to clarify this issue, but I feel like we're still, it's still not clarified. So in the in the um, message that you just read from Representative Paternal, um, she said something like, home educated students receiving EFA are required, will be required to perform background checks. That, I don't think that's correct because once, a student receives EFA mm -hmm. funding, they are no longer a home educated student. They may still be homeschooling in some fashion. They may be yeah. educating, teaching their children at home. Their children are learning at home. But my understanding is they are no longer home educating under RSA 193A. Is So is that correct or am I not understanding correctly? You are correct. You are correct. Right. You are correct. And I think that really goes to a point to a former former 
council member always made the point that our language is important, yes. right? Because home education um, by the law is 193A and an EFA student is, is it 194F? I believe so. So yeah. those are two different programs. Two different. Yeah. Right. And I think this is very important where language matters. Yeah. But my understanding is she did use the word home educated, but I would interpret that also out there. That's a great point as a student schooled at home under EFA, not necessarily a 193A student. So this is a, a point where we even have to help educate our legislators. Mm -hmm. well, right. Yeah, even... Um... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Jill. Sorry, I was going to say, um, even when you look at the text of the um, the proposal, uh, proposed bill, um, it says the Department of Education shall require that all employees and volunteers of non-public schools or providers that choose to accept scholarship students under this chapter. So those are people, those providers are people who, who have registered um, to receive those funds. And so I don't know that there's um, um, uh, um, home educators are not required to register themselves as providers. So I don't know that they would be included in that. No, they would not. I mean, the, way the amendment is written, they would not be. Right. If they're educating their, their own student at home, even if they're EFA, the way the bill is written, it's my understanding that they would not the parent themselves would not be required to have a background check. Right. That is not how one of the legislators answered a question related to that, though. And this is, that's Diane speaking. It's Diane, sorry. I attended um, the hearings. Yeah. I attended the hearing in October and also um, the vote taken this week, Monday. Um, it is clear that the legislators have some problems with this language as well, whether EFA, home educated, homeschooled, all you know, commingle or can coexist. Um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for them to differentiate in their arguments, honestly. Um, but there were there were questions about whether or not an EFA yes, parent yeah, would would be subject to it. And I can say that I left the hearing and it was unclear. Okay. I think there were lots of scenarios where even a, there's an overlap, like a co-op. And if there are EFA students, children receiving funding, and home educated students with no funding, right. there is a problem because it would potentially subject everyone in that co-op to mm -hmm. the background check. Yes. Right. Right. And, and the, that, that's this is Mike. That's the way, the, particularly the first section reads to me. Yes. That if anybody is giving instruction and they yes. receive EFA, then they have to have a background check. Yeah. Right. If you dial back, this is Diane again. Yes. If you dial back the video, uh, Representative Tanner specifically says the EFAs are taking the, the federal money and they should expect a criminal background check. Right. right. The, the, my big question was, who is going to get this background check? It says submit the background check. Who is it being submitted to? And what type of, uh, one of the issues they brought up in the hearing was, uh, some of them were really adamant about it being a FBI background check versus something done by a third party and not the FBI background check. So who is gonna pay for the background check? Who is it going to be submitted to? Who's going to retain it? Where is it going to be? Those are all questions, especially with, a, like Diane just mentioned, a co-op. You have co-ops where there are not parents teaching. You have outsiders that are volunteering their time to share their passion with students. So you have a lot of people who are not parents. Their background check is going where? And who is speaking, please? That's Rebecca. Rebecca, thank you. Um, so this, so if, if I could just clarify, then um, what I'm what I'm hearing is that there is some uh, uh, there's a wish to have it clarified more. Um, 
because it seems like um, people who are um, are teaching in co-ops uh, might be subject to background checks. I think that's still different from parents in their homes being subject to background checks. And, and was that discussion had at any of these hearings? I wasn't clear about your question. I'm sorry. Um, so what I'm hearing is that there is some uh, question about whether a uh, a parent or an, or another volunteer or a paid person in a co-op teaching children that they they might be required to have background checks yes. if there are IFA funded yes. children in the co-op. Um, yes. I have um, that's different from saying that parents in their homes teaching their own children need to have background checks. And so I'm and and that um, that idea or that fear has been discussed in the public. So I'm wondering whether that issue came up, that distinction came up at these meetings. They made every attempt, this is Diane, they made every attempt to clarify that home educated RSA 193 would not, would, they would be excluded. That was the their amendment. Do you have a copy of the amendment? Yeah, the amendment. In the amendment, there are two lines. This is amendment 2300H that was handed out at the hearings. I've not been able to, to locate it online. Uh, perhaps it's up by now, but as of yesterday, I couldn't find it. No. Uh, on line 12, this shall not apply to parents providing at home school education. Thank you. <laughs> on line 30, it says this section shall not pertain to a parent giving a non EFA home education program to their children. So this is April. One thing that strikes me um, at the first time that home education is mentioned in this amendment is the at-home school education. And to me, like I almost want to chuckle because <laughs> we don't just educate our children at home, right? And we continue to be lifelong learners, not That's in a right. place. And I think it's important to distinguish that even though you're a home-educated child, you don't have to be sitting at your kitchen table in your home to be learning, right? So um, that's interesting. But the other thing that's really concerning about this bill is the unintended consequences and how it will affect 193A home educators. Because, you know, a 193A student and a 194 F student can share the same educational resources. Right. That could be as simple as someone got a great discount to go on a field trip, right? And now I want to join, you know, the families want to join together to do that. So I feel like this really needs more thought and time put into it. Um, and so, which would mean that parent would have to have a background check because she had an EFA student going along on the field trip. Right. Question. Can you clarify for me, please? Um, in your agenda, you have listed the HB 628, which is what we're talking about. Um, but someone in the meeting had just talked about an amendment that they couldn't locate online. Um, I would like to see if I can find that. Can you... Um, I would, I'd be very interested because I think it has applications too for um, non-public schools um, in yeah. general. Oh, yes, um, absolutely. Because, Diane, absolutely. Right? Diane has a copy. Diane, could you please email me a copy? Yeah, and then Because there isn't one online. Job. It's not I online? Have, what? No. No. I had to take a picture of the amendment that was being handed out at the hearing hmm. because there were not enough in distribution that day. So oh. I have a JPEG copy. I have a hard copy here uh, that could I printed I, out. Could I ask my representative for one? 
I yes, uh, the House Education Committee members absolutely had one that day. Okay. What was it called? Uh, it's Amendment Twenty Three Hundred H. Thank you. So, April, I had a question. Yes. You know, with all of these things, this is Ruth Ward. With all of these things going on, we're talking about this bill and who is going to be um, have a background check or not having a background check. Did anybody ask Linda Tanner why she thinks this is necessary? I did hear that in the hearing yes. that I listened to. Yeah. Where is this coming from? Yeah. I did hear that question. I never received. I never heard the answer to that question. Isn't and that would be interesting to know where is this bill coming from? Yeah. Why does she feel that it's so important for for this particular group of people? to have a background check to the point we're talking about parents who are teaching their children have to have a, a background check. Right. It just doesn't make any sense. So when I, you were there in person, Diane, this is April speaking. When I listened online, what I heard is there were many um, groups came forward to present that they already require background checks. Yes, yes there were other amendments. Yes. Right, so the yeah. question, you know, part of the question is, why is there an attempt to legislate this if there's many groups already doing this and it's a practice in place? Right. So well, I, I could talk to that. Uh, there were two or three other documents distributed at the October 17th hearing. One was from the Diocese of Manchester and the other was from uh, the non-public school advisory council chairman, Doug Dave Tebow? Yeah, Dave Tebow. Tebow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then a third came from Frenda. Yeah. Uh, all three of those outlined their criminal background, background check checks. policies, uh, whether they had them, how often they did them, whether there were additional safety training sessions, et cetera. Um, so all three of those entities were uh, said that they did them. But then there was an attorney, Attorney Fenton was present and she was able to give um, testimony, I, I guess is what you would call it. They were able to ask her what type of background yeah. check is done by the State Department of Safety. Yes. And that's an FBI it's check FBI that they check. kept re referencing. And they questioned, especially the Prenda letter where they mentioned all the different uh, things that they checked, but they were trying to argue that that was not as good as an FBI check. Yeah, right. that's correct. It looks, it, it sounded like to me that they were pressing for, right. because Prender used checker or price, uh, pacer yeah. uh, for a background check. And that did not seem to be suitable for some of the members of the committee that they wanted to have an FBI background check, which means if this should pass, that would we be looking at these, um, even the non-public schools having to use a different background check to be submitted where? May I ask who, who made the who made the prior comment? Rebecca. 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 Before Rebecca. Diane. 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 Thank you. And this is April. Just one thing I've wondered through this, even though it doesn't affect my child as a one ninety three. A student, but I think about educators who are tutoring, right, outside of their contractual agreements with their districts and offering services to students. I even wonder for those, you know, educators, how, do, how would that affect them? They've had a background check through their district, but they may not have access, right? That's Correct. the district's property. What do we do for those people who are doing some moonlighting? and offering excellent resources to students. Is that going to stymie that? Yeah. Currently, yes. if you are a volunteer for the Boy Scouts, you get a background check there. And then if you go work for the public schools, you get a background check there. They don't follow you. You can't transfer them. You get a separate one each time. Right. OK. Right. Yeah. Um, Tim, oh. oh. If Tim I may, has a comment. Yes. Um, yeah. So just some, some of the background, because this does impact three of my programs. Um, you know, non-public schools is a program I run as well. And non-public school teachers are not required to have a background check. Um, 
certified teachers, maybe, depending on some nuances. Okay. So this will obviously impact the non-public school community. Yeah. yeah. Um, if they're now required to get a background check. My understanding of the FBI level background check is that a state agency has to receive that. Right. Um, and that's just my understanding. Um, I just talking with Stephen Appleby, who's the the uh, higher ed director who runs the credentialing. Yeah, that was... um, is that it would have to be a state agency that that we can go to. Yeah. The FBI will not send them to anybody else. And it's also my understanding that background charts are destroyed once they're completed. Okay. So it's almost a, a snapshot in time, background check. Um, you passed or didn't, and then they have to be destroyed within so many days. I don't think background checks are something that are retained in files for hmm. perpetuity. So um, I have a question. This is Diane. I want to ask Tim. Um, for public schools, they do a background check, mm -hmm. a criminal background yeah. check. That is a hiring procedure. Mm -hmm. It gets destroyed. That person's employed for 20 years. We don't know from day two what's in their background. Right. Correct? I think there might you might be being subject to it. Um, yeah, that's correct. Okay. But there is a report um, correct in the law that says no, it's I, I believe that you have to get a new background check every so often. Yeah, I'm not aware of that timeline. No, I, I don't believe so. I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought you said they get background checked and then and then they could like on day two do something and then we won't know. Right. I'm, I don't, it's just I hard don't to know. hear. I was just trying to track the conversation. Right. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, once once somebody's cleared their background check, I'm not aware of a timeline where we recheck them as they stay in our employment um, and that we would only know through public records or some other notification through some law enforcement. What about if they change school districts? This is the really? It, yeah, if you, and if you change school districts, you get another background check. Okay, right. okay. okay. So this is well, April. We, we, that's interesting because I check my teachers every three years. That's a great practice, Jill. And you're in non-public yes. school? Non-public yes. school. Yeah. And this is April. It's interesting to hear that public schools are once and done because I do volunteer work um, through, you know, my local church, which is in the Diocese of Manchester. So every four years we have to have a background check. And then I volunteer with Girl Scouts. And there's a background check periodically for Girl Scouts as well. So it's very interesting. And I think talking about background checks, if you really think about it, the people who are in compliance, those really aren't the people we need to worry about, right? I mean, I, mean, I think that's something to think about. So Tim, I do have a question for you. Is it accurate to say that non-public schools require background checks for accreditation? No. That is not correct. Okay. But um, one more clarification. This is Diane again. Um, what is my thing I'm sorry. Non-public schools can include private schools. If do you have numbers of what your non-public school? You said there are 140. Yeah. I, yeah. And how? What percentage of those would fall into? We know what the Catholic policy is. They do it every four years. So what percentage of that 140 becomes? Well, then we I don't know because it's not that yeah. we have authority over. They have, yeah. right. they yeah. wouldn't be privy no. to that information. No. Similar to- Well, to I think that's more of an issue than this. Well, I think someone at the hearing said that one third of the non-public schools- Yeah, I questioned that. Did background data. Yes. They said that with that store, not at all. Right, I'd like to see the facts or yes. the numbers. That's all I'm saying. Okay. I, I, I just have I would more. probably say one third of the non-accredited non-public schools. I mean, our accreditation process requires us to be back to 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 be background checking our our employees. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, Jill, you're talking about the third party accreditation by like NIASC or somebody else. Is that what you mean by accreditation? Because the Department of Education does not accredit non-public no. schools. We just simply approve non-public schools to be compulsory attendance requirements. But if they're saying an accrediting agency, which a school can choose to become accredited to a third-party agency, 
if they require for accreditation purposes background checks, that wouldn't be anything that is coming through to the, the Department of Education at all. So those are two yeah. different processes. Correct. Okay. The accreditation process is something yeah. that non public school can choose to do or not. That and it's something to do their approval from the Department of Education. It's, it seems there's a couple, this is my uh, couple areas that are very muddy. So mm -hmm. one is the 193 versus the EFA. Is it, does this just, <clears throat> does this just apply to an EFA parent? Or if there's, a, if there's an EFA child in the audience, does that require the instructor to yes. have the background check? It seems to just be the instructor but it's not yeah. super clear. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, because under 5D, it says for an employee or a volunteer providing instruction in person to an EFA student. So it would be. Right. And and how we define providing instruction. Does that mean you're handing out cookies in the back of the room and you're running the break? Or does it mean you're in front of the class well, as a volunteer, you'd be handing out cookies. Sure, right, right, right. right. Um, and this is April, likewise, a field trip. They're the presenter, right? A third party presenter, right? Yes. Right. You know. Um, the the other piece in part 2A, in the first section, it mentions certain scholarship organizations uh, by the department. Um, but in 2A, it just mentions children's scholarship organization funded programs and it doesn't refer to the department again. And so I'm thinking of like a library performer comes in, they may have been funded through another children's scholarship organization and have they run background checks on them. Uh, so that's another right. Right. muddy area. Right. Tim, did you come? Yeah, yes. I just wanted to bring up, so the, the state works with children's scholarship fund Children's Scholarship Fund to, to, to basically manage the EFA program, but they also manage the ECT program, which is education tax credit, which right. can be used by home educated 193A yes. families. But I don't see that. Does that mean that home educating 193A families would be subject to this if they were receiving the ECT? Well, I, in the committee, they did bring up the tax credit, and one of the representatives mentioned that that really was not state or federal money. That, it came yeah, from right. businesses. Right. So right. therefore, that did not fall. Okay, so that's not, that yeah. was going to be my question. Is that, is that state money? But yeah. it's, they said it is not, so that's good. Right. And the other thing I wanted to mention, and again, it may be a better discussion with someone who manages the EFA, is I know it, I believe it was set up, and maybe you would have some insight on this, that the money didn't actually go to parents from the EFA. It goes to the class wallet. Yes. And so does that exclude parents being included in the background check? Because they don't actually get the money. It's the class right. wallet is getting the money. Okay, so I'm just looking at the chat, yeah. and it appears someone just placed a link in the chat with um, a link to the amendment. Oh, or if anyone oh. is out there remotely, can you guys um, Where is see it? that comment? Quarter, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was There's the um, yes. secretary of the Home Education Committee and they emailed her and got a copy of it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Jill, is that... Was that your comment? I'm so, oh, my eyes can't see that far, so thank you. That's okay. Yeah, it is. Um, so if you click on the link, um, there's a, a picture, of a screenshot of somebody, or a picture somebody must have taken on their phone uh, with their phone of the amendment. Oh, so okay. um, it's there. Okay, Perfect. thank you. Can you check it back? <laughs> The nice thing about this, I suppose, is um, this won't be taken up until January, is our assumption. Right. So, you know, maybe we have more time to find out more about it when we I meet think, again. Um, 
Yeah. And, and this so is Jill. I think that um, the, just the fact that we've had this much discussion, just the group of us um, warrants um, for, you know, we have all of these questions. I think it certainly warrants more discussion on the legislative side. It's important that we notify our Absolutely. representative. I'm sorry, not just our representatives, but to notify other home Absolutely. educators of all sorts, every path, you know, all the other pathways as well, through um, any organizations that we're part of. Part of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jill's talking, but there's no audio. You're muted. Was that a yes that you had something, Jill? No, okay. Um, no, no, somebody just opened my office door to ask me a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> At this point, I'm so sorry. I'm just gonna pop off. I'm gonna mute and then turn my video off for about two minutes and I'll be right back. Thanks. <laughs> They're trying not to disturb me, but there's a question. Okay. So I'm gonna ask Tim. Tim, how do, I mean, people would, in person, they may need to step away from mm -hmm. a meeting. How does that work now remotely with the new statute in RSA 1 about being able to see and hear throughout the meeting? Like if someone has to step out, right, right, but they're not engaging in any other way, would, is that deemed I think permissible? that's acceptable. In, in, but like, in the house, what would in the, the Senate? And in the jail call, that happens all the time. Yeah. Okay. Somebody steps up and says, so and so left at right. 11. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or we'll return that, you know, whatever. Okay. So yeah. do do I need to make an, a note of what time someone probably left? Yes. 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 Something comes up. Okay. So it's 3.40. So we'll note that Jill stepped out at 3.40. And then when she comes back, we'll just note when she returns. Right. Is that and we've, okay. we've maintained a forum even with her absence. Even, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, any other comments about HB 628 at this time? I do have one final comment. Sure, Ms. Diane. Diane. I, I do want to say that I feel confident that everyone in this room believes that every child should be safe and that we are not fighting against that. We, uh, we are not disparaging that or the people putting forth this bill um, talking about the safety of children. Um, I think that if you check the research, it's always one of the top three reasons someone chose to home educate. That's a great point. That's it. Before we move on to the legislative service request and see, I just want to ask, um, Senator Ward, are you aware of any legislation that we should be I've just seen a couple of the uh, the house. They haven't done anything but the Senate bills yet. Okay. Yeah, work on them. But most of the house bills have come up and I've seen a number of them. And I, I've seen, I think J.R. Hollis is, yeah. he had a thing on the, on parents and have a constitutional right to direct the education. Yeah, sure. yeah. So that's one of his bills. And I've seen a couple of similar bills that we have a right to okay. uh, direct the education and the yeah. health and welfare of your child. Okay. So those are the ones from the house that are coming over. I don't know when. Okay. Mm. And is it possible that these like two LSRs could be merged into one bill? Eventually, if, if, somebody, if somebody looks at this, that, that these are very similar to me, that has to do with the sponsor. Okay. You know, sometimes I really feel this is my bill and I want it. Okay. Uh, but it's always possible. Well, you can amend one to take something from somebody and put it in here. So that's all negotiable during the okay. committee hearings. Mm. So just for someone who's so this is April, sorry, Althea, I gotta get better at that. Um just for someone who's um not been a legislator or understand exactly how this works. So um a legislative service request goes in. Is that basically like the idea of a title and then someone actually writes the bill? How does that? Say that happen? I, this is report. I want to have something about the parents have a right to educate their children. I have a say in how they're educated. 
that's my idea. So I go down and I go down to the L the uh, L O B no L O B O L S, and I said, "This is what I want to say." And then they'll ask some questions, and then they put it in what I call the legal East language. Okay, you know, and they have to be very specific. And then you get it back, and you take a look at it, and you say, "Is this what I wanted?" Mm. And if you say, "Oh, this is beautiful, perfect. This is just what I want," then you just let them know that. This is fine. And then you start looking for co-sponsors. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when the bill has a number and everything else, at some point they it, the bills get divvied out between the different committees. So I will probably get, well, eventually get the house education, whichever house education bills have passed to come over to the Senate. And the same thing with the, with the Senate bills. Okay. So the Senate will take care of all the Senate bills first. And the house okay. will do all the house bills and then cross over in March. Yeah. Okay. They get all the house bills and they get all of our bills. When should we be on? This is April again. Is January a good time to kind of be watching to see what these LSR, what the bill numbers turn into? You should have the bill numbers pretty soon. As soon okay. as they, the house bills right now, I think, have numbers on them. Okay. They have just, they're finishing up all the house LSR, so they will have a number. And then you can, I think you go on the website and, and look it up, look at all the bills that are coming in. Yeah. Like the general court website? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. There's going to be lots of them. Yeah. Okay. There's there over are... a thousand of them. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There are lots of them. And I heard the Senate has 362 bills, which wow. is way, you know, for 24 people and have that many bills. <laughs> wow. So. Thank you very much. I appreciate that no explanation. Um, so on 6C, there's two uh, legislative service requests that are listed, and both of these have to do with um, the rights of parents and children. So these are things that we might just want to keep um, a watch out for moving forward. Any questions or concerns about those? Okay. Moving on to number seven, uh, the commissioner's report. Or I should probably ask... Senator Ward, I think I did ask this, but before we move along, any other, anything else we need to know that's going on in the legislature at this time? No, there's not, the, all the bills are being written. So that okay. I have a couple of things that I have to finish. I have to give an interim report on the EFA. Uh, it has to be done every year. Okay. What we have done, how it has worked, and how many kids are using it and all that kind of stuff. Okay. That's a meeting with them on next, I guess it's Monday. So that has to be out. The one that I'm late with is the teacher shortage and incentives to maintain them in the school system. Okay. Um, I guess I have to say that Bill has hit a snag. The final report has hit a snag too. A couple of people are not very happy about some of the things that were deleted because they feel that that takes care of ruins the whole bill. So hopefully we're going to hash that out on Monday. So. Okay, thank you. So hopefully when we meet again in January, we should know a little bit more. Oh yeah. About these. Okay, yeah. great. Those two will be out. Okay, thank you. All right, sorry. Moving on to number seven, the uh, commissioner's report updates from the New Hampshire Department of Education. Yeah, so uh, Tim Carney, Department of Education, go through quickly. The ED315 rule revisions have been posted on the NHS uh, webpage. So those are complete for now. Uh, the web page update. Um, I have worked on an update, um, updating the forms to reflect the rule changes, things like that. I've also included some information about the ECT and the DFA. Yeah. To I was just surprised the ECT had not been on our website in the past um, because it's been around for a long time. And yep. It's a good funding opportunity, um, and so I did provide some clarity. I hope with the EFA. In that it's not a not yeah. 193A home education. Yeah. Thing. It looked so good. Go yeah. It looked good. I it read it. Okay. I agree. Good. I was Very happy good. to see those updates. Yes. Yeah. 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 Look um, great. So I think it'll be helpful for parents. Um, I'm finally on the verge of starting the FAQ document. So um, hopefully by the next meeting, we'll have something um, in that because we are seeing a lot of, um, you know, not only parents, but districts and non public schools have questions about. Uh, roles as a participating agency, for example. And then um, we do get a lot of adult um, 
former home educated adults coming back looking for documentation that their parents did not provide at the time. And so I'd like to provide them some information. Um, I got a call from a recruiter today and I walked them through what home education documentation for an adult is um, or is not because okay. they don't understand the New Hampshire laws. And so, it, so I think if I had some FAQs that actually were helpful to adults that are now looking for that documentation they need in their 30s sometimes uh, by completed homeschool but they don't have a piece of paper because the parents never sent in a completion notice or things like that. And so um, I think those FAQs will be very helpful to many different um, parties that participate in home education. Including, I would, this is April, I'm assuming including us on the council because we don't know what calls that you're fielding mm -hmm. yeah. and questions that you're hearing right. Right. in the education department yeah. regarding home education. Yeah. So I think that would be helpful for yeah, us. I think that will be so. Um, just quickly, we still have the vacant yet memberships. Oh, yes, Althea, you're muted. My my keyboard is kind of loud, so I mute because I don't want people to hear me <laughs> 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 clicking away. Um, I had a few questions on number two, and I can ask them at the end of your report and go back, or or now, whichever you prefer. Now is fine. Yep. Okay. Um, so I really appreciate all the efforts you've made to clarify things. I think it's so important because as I mentioned earlier, um, on the HEAC, we've we've struggled for a long time just to just to have everybody on the same page. And, you know, like we talked about educating legislators and people in, in all parts of the world that we live in here. Um, so, uh, but I did have a few thoughts uh, to run by you. Um, one is um, at the top of the home education page, it references um, chapter 279 to laws of 1990. Um, it also references the ED315 administrative rules and RSA 186C21, definition of educationally disabled child. Um, it, on the home, in the uh, New Hampshire Homeschooling Coalition, we, we always try to refer people to the law. We want people to read the law and really understand it and not just rely on um, our interpretation of it. Um, so I wanted to suggest that um, and and I understand, I see that at, further down on the page, there is a, uh, what's it called? Helpful links or something like that, where you do link mm -hmm. to the other, oh, I'm sorry, I see that Jill has returned. I just want to note down the time. Oh, thank you. And that's 3.52. Okay. Um, I, I, I would like to suggest, um, putting RSA, a link to 193A yeah. um, at the top of the page um, and also adding a link to the rules. Um, and that way people can can look, it can go directly there if they need to. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, and that's easily done. So. There's also, I mean, the other ones that we've linked to on our page, and this is for your consideration, are um, RSA 193.1 compulsory at attendance law. Um, That's in the rules of law section. Okay. Without that, yeah. Right, that would be in there. Um, and we have a couple of others, but I think if we, if we at least um, bring them to those, that would be yeah. helpful. Yeah, makes sense. Great. Great. Um, the second thing was, uh, let's see here. Um, this is kind of a small detail, but um, you link to some very helpful forms. Um, and, um, but I, I thought it might be helpful to say that these are one possible form they can use, that they're not required to use those particular mm -hmm. forms. Um, and really a person can express their intent to homeschool or notification of termination in any way that they want. Yeah. Um, so just to say that those are 
uh, not required, but suggested in some way. Yeah. And I say that in the email I sent to parents, and I just didn't notice that it wasn't also stated on our webpage. So I'll certainly yeah. add that. That's great. That's that's awesome. Um, and the third thing was, um, and and I apologize. I don't know when the last time I really looked at this page in detail is. Um, was I think you said that you added the education tax credits um, information in this round of revisions? Correct. It's under funding yes. sources for families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, no. funding sources for families. And so the EFA one was already there? No, 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 he put it on there. Okay, so that whole section is new then? Correct. Okay, so I guess I'm going to ask, um, considering the fact that acceptance of EFA funds pulls people out of 183A and puts them into a different category, um, in an effort to not blur lines, I would suggest that we reconsider having this information on here um, because mm -hmm. it would be like at the bottom of the page, you know, we could also say, here's information on non public schools or here's information on public schools or, you know, other options that are not home education. Um, because yeah, yeah. because of the confusion around and the blurring of the lines between those, I I would like to make that suggestion. Althea, this is April. I thought it was helpful to have the information about the education freedom accounts on there simply because it does include students who have previously notified as home educating under uh, RSA 193A must terminate right. their home education program in accordance with NHED rule ED 315.06 and RSA 193A colon 5 number 3 prior to enrolling in the EFA program. It goes on to cite some other um, sources. I thought that was helpful because those are conversations that we've had here and it certainly clarifies that if you accept the EFA funds, you now have an obligation to notify you're no longer educating under 193A. So maybe it's just the order in which the information about EFA is presented. Or if you want, like, uh, so I, I would respectfully disagree because I, I guess I agree with yeah, I agree. Um, some of the other comments in that yeah. it's, we. I just get so many phone calls from yeah. families about the EFA because they, they're contacting the home education office. Yeah. So there's just so much confusion and I was hoping this would help Yes. If you're looking to do home ed to take advantage of the EFA, because that's how everybody talks about it, they're landing on my web page yeah. and there's nothing about it. And so yeah. they think they're just going to do home ed and then they call the Children's Scholarship Fund through some other means. Um, and if it's if I need to provide something in bold or more bright light saying you can't take the EFA <laughs> if you're home ed. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that I could certainly, um, I would certainly consider doing if you think it's not strong enough, maybe how it's presented that, hey, there's some funding opportunities, but if you're going to do the EFA, you can't be 93A. Yeah. No, know. I think it's helpful. Um, right. But maybe it's, you know, if I need to bowl or something like that, I can take another look at it, Althea, maybe to see if I can make it uh, stand out a little bit more. Right. That, you know, here's a, de a decision point for some parent. Right. Because honestly, if you, this is April, if you are just scanning through, right, and you see if a, and you don't read the smaller print, you may just make the assumption without reading right, right. that's available. So some bold may okay. definitely yeah. help. And I think yeah. that would, right. you know, I can definitely take a look at it from that perspective. But. Okay. And so, so, um, yeah, and I appreciate that because I'm, you're giving me your perspective of how people are coming to you in their phone calls. Yeah. Um, I want the EFA, therefore I'm going to host homeschool, which is sort of the opposite of the way I was looking at it. I'm homeschooling. Hey, what about this EFA thing? So um, some more clarification would be very helpful. Um, okay. um, but um, I guess if you if you can understand it from the perspective of someone who's been homeschooling, who 
needs money or want, would like to dedicate more funds to their child's education and they go to this page, it's very tempting to say, hey, wait a minute, here's this funding I can get. Um, and um, so I, I guess my question then is, um, is there another page for education freedom, freedom accounts? And, um, and the other one, what is it? C, the, the uh, uh, tax credits. Is there a, another page on your site? that there is a page for the EFA um, that the EFA administrator has put together it's not very informative yet but the ETC we don't have anything in, as I'm aware in the department websites it's all at the children's scholarship fund site but you know as we're talking I'm wondering if I remove the EFA from under the heading of funding sources for parents and just mm -hmm. present it under a separate heading if that would help with the clarity, because it isn't a funding source for home educating parents under 193A, right, the EFA. So maybe that's where there's a little confusion. So if I pulled the EFA out, it just had a separate EFA blurb that wasn't under the heading of funding oh. sources for home educating parents. Mm. That would help reduce the confusion. So why so would it be, why would it be on this page then? In other words, why would it just be a link to another page? If you're looking for information on EFA, go to this because other I, page. I think, it's, I think it's really important for home educating parents to understand that there's, if you're gonna choose the EFA, for example, your kiddos can't access their curricular and co-curricular activities. Okay. You know, most parents don't realize that about the EFA because nobody really tells them. And there's and also- I think that's really important. And this is April also knowing that there's an obligation to notify that you're no right. longer That's right. home educating your child under yeah. 193A to help families be in compliance. I'm sure I, Jill has her yeah. hand raised. I just want to make sure she has I an do. I do. I just, this is just, and please, this is a new area of, of um, information for me. So from what I understand that if they are accepting EFA funds and they um, have filed that letter of intent, then they are now contacting that participating agency and terminating their um, homeschool education program in order to accept those EFA funds. Is that, is that, is my, cur is my understanding correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. That is not clear. When you when you look at the um, the legislation or when you look at the case text, right, for um, these, and I, I am, my um, legislative parlance is not um, very good. I'm sorry. So please forgive me. Um, but when you look at the information that's online about the requirements that the state has for a participating agency and for homeschooling families, um, I currently tell families that you terminate your, you know, if you decide to leave, you need to let us know. Um, but then what happens? What what are they then under? And what requirements are they under? So because by having a home education program, they're agreeing to a diff, you know, to a, a bunch of different things that they're going to file their letter of intent, that they're going to do portfolios every year. Um, once they're not in that program, then what? It's whatever other means of meeting the compulsory attendance requirement they choose. So that could be the EFA program. It could be a public school. It but, could be non school. Right. But who, I mean, I I have families here who do drop-in classes. Um, they're receiving EFA funds because they use those funds to pay for classes. And I have their letters of intent. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I, I can simply say that's not mine. Right. It's not a home. I, I'm sorry, Tim. I didn't. It's an, EFA, it's an EFA responsibility to make sure that the participants of the EFA program are following the law and rules of the EFA program. So I I don't know, for example, if a student has taken an EFA that had notified me as participating agency. There's no way for me to know if they now take in an EFA. And there's nothing in the law or rule that says that requires me to track that home ed student. Right. Jill, it looks so, like this so, is April. It seems like your heart is with um, 
making sure that as a participating participating agency that you're doing the right thing, right? And helping mm -hmm. these students, could it be as easy as just asking as you know, have you previously notified as you know under 193A? Or right. if you know for I, sure I could. This, yeah, or if you know for sure that you have a 193A notification letter from a particular student that's now educating under 194F without notifying that educating under 193A ended, it's an opportunity to educate that family that, you know, this needs to happen and we're right. taking our responsibility as partic participating agency very yep. seriously for your child. Right. right. Well, for sure. But I think, I think that it, um, I think that if this is the case, then I think that those other, uh, the requirements for the participating agency should be updated to, um, ensure compliance. Um, right. I mean, because that's what I look at when I make sure, you know, to make sure that I'm, I am doing my, my, um, responsibility as a participating agency. Um, but I guess, so that that's that that piece then sure absolutely i could certainly do that that's not an issue um but i think that if i wasn't part of this committee i wouldn't know that so i think that that it, I, I think you're right i think i'll pick up on what jill is saying is that i think the HEAC and i guess the the department of education have a responsibility to make it all very clear to all of the parties involved to the parents to the participating agencies to everyone at every level, to clarify it on the website and in all our communications. Mm -hmm. My question was to Jill. My second, sorry, the second part of my question, so that there's that piece, the participating agency piece in April, I appreciate that. Yes, I, my concern is to make sure that I'm doing my due diligence as a participating agency. Um, however, my other question, and it's not clear um, in reading the information that I've read online, is if they are no longer part of 193A and they are now part of 193F, um, are they still under the requirements for doing a portfolio review for for doing uh, for doing that testing requirement? Yeah. Um, yeah. If they're no longer in that category, then what you know what what well, are their requirements? If they're yeah. kind of rescinding that that um, piece, then then what else is there? Where are they out in limbo somewhere? What 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 where then are they? No, EFA has its own requirements. Yeah, they have. They have, I think it's a portfolio. They can do either. Is, they can do a portfolio or testing, assessment. but it goes right yeah. to the EFA. It does not go to you as a right. as a non-public school. So the EFA administrator and the Children's Scholarship Fund yes. manage that, those requirements yes. for student assistance. That so, is why they require, that's why they require those then, the educational attainment. That's why they require that. Yes. Yes, yes. And those yeah. requirements are different than 193A. The yes, requirements are. are different. So the yes. evaluation, for example, uh, um, I think there are three that are similar, but um, um, uh, 193A home educated students are also allowed to have another valid measurement tool agreed upon between mm -hmm. the parent and the commissioner of education, the resident district superintendent, mm -hmm. or the yeah. non-public school principal. So that okay. is not that is not available to 194 uh, students. Got it. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. Yeah. And the yeah. Yeah. and I believe that um, the Children's Scholarship Fund um, also um, reviews the curriculum of the student to make sure that it complies with the requirements of the law. And that is not what is under 193A. Rebecca had a comment. Yeah, my question, I guess, was to Jill or to you. Um, the students that are under the EFA would not or does not, is not required to have the non-public school as a participating agency. They use the EFA as a participating agency. So you, if you had a student coming in that's under EFA, you would not be the participating agency for that student. Right. That that, that, I, that is now clear to me. Okay. Yeah, there's no that something like that. Okay. 
Mike has a question or comment. Yeah, Tim, is it possible to uh, 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 the EFA page? Is that under the Department of Ed? Yes, there is. We have the new administrator, and there is an EFA. Yeah. Page. Could we ask them to put a little banner that says, "Once you accept EFA funds, you are no longer under the under the rule or the law considered a home mm -hmm. educator." Yeah, and I, I can check with our director yeah. on that. Yeah, right. I mean, without sounding me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clarify. Yeah, I mean, I can um, yeah. Oh, um, this is April speaking. So I'm wondering after this discussion and Althea's point is there's once a student exits 193A, could be of several different ways instead of specifically mentioning EFAs, would it be more appropriate to have something about how to exit a 193A home education programs to any of these pathways, right? Should it be public school, non-public school, or EFA? Because the notification requirement would be the same, correct? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if that may be, would that make a little more sense out the edge just to clarify notification requirements when completing when terminating. or terminating? Because we do have a section on terminating. We have a, an yeah. example form. Okay. So if you're saying you should maybe expand on that. Well, would, would that make a little more sense to you, Athea? In other words, to, to not focus on just one or two options, but to say these this is your range of options. I guess so. I mean, does that line up with other pages. So for example, on the public school page, does it say, and if you would like to leave the public schools, here are all your options. You know, if you would like to make, uh, you know. Yeah, I, don't yeah. I think the confusion comes because the EFA students are still being right. in school. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a just what makes this different. Would that be, if that truly is a frequently asked question, but it maybe be better to put that in the FAQ. Oh, I certainly will. Yeah. Yeah. So. So again, just by yeah. including it on the web page, I, I was just trying to get families who are looking to do something outside of the non-public school. Right. And they're looking yes. for options. I was just trying to make it easier for them to see you can home educate or you can homeschool. If you homeschool, you can use EFA, which is the $4,600, which is attractive to a lot of families. If it's essentially the same thing that they're doing as home education. Yeah. The one nuance, right, is that there's some chain difference in uh, the accountability, right? EFA is more stringent, but there's also the lack of access, a right to access of your resident district under the EFA. Which is a big and deal for some people, right? Mm -hmm. Because if your kiddo is playing sports, they're done doing that under the EFA, unless the yeah. district is cooperative yeah. or chooses to be one. And, and those there's are nuances, I yes. think. Yes. Oh, okay. And Thank there's you. the difference in evaluations as well. Correct. Yeah. Yes. They yes. lose an option um, of evaluation. Yeah. I right. just want to interject that it's four twelve, and <laughs> Senator Ward needs to leave the meeting. Thank you for Thank you. being here, Senator Ward. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving yes. and Merry Christmas. <laughs> Should I move on to the home education? Sure. Counts? So, um, yeah. Um, oh, Althea, you have some more. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that on the Children's Scholarship Fund website, which I understand is a separate organization, right? It's not under the DOE. Correct. But these issues are also not clarified and they're, you know, for example, it says, um, if your child is currently a homeschooler and qualifies for an EFA, their day-to-day -day experience may continue to look the same using the EFA. Parents are absolutely permitted to continue to educate children at home. It sort of really continues to conflate the issue. Um, you don't have direct control over that, but there, people are not getting clarification um, by going to the to that page, to that website. And I agree with you on that, yeah. but I have been through that web page. 
Um, what I can do is simply talk to my director and see if that's something she's willing to bring forward to these children's scholarship fund. Um, yeah. And hopefully they would be open, but I can't speak to what might happen with that. So, Thank you. But I can't talk to her about that. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, off of adult ed, we talked about that. Item three, item four, vacant VAC memberships. We still have uh, three Home Educator Association um, vacancies. So if you do know anybody, please let me know. I did talk to Jen because she emailed it to me about something else and mentioned it to her as well. Um, the home education counts. So this is basically the reports we get. It's a snapshot of October 1st of each year. And these were the counts. And they're supposed to be the counts of the, the uh, notifications received over the last year by districts, non-public schools, my office. Um, and there's some issues with the, the tables that I attack. Um, you know, one of them is I want to change the word homeschool to home educated on these reports. Um, our data didn't get dropped in in one spot. We still have four schools, I think, that did not report, that didn't report yet. Um, when I looked at last year, they had all reported. So I think this is just a matter of our folks, and the data folks chasing down these districts. Uh, initially, we had negative numbers, and I explained to them we can't have negative numbers for notifications. Um, and so I think we're, I work to clean these up a little bit. And I think it might be some, I wish Heather were here, but it might be some education with districts as well about um, that their new notifications, not cumulative, because I think some of these look rather high for the size of communities. I might be wrong, but I, I want to look into that a little bit. And then, um, the numbers for preschool, when it was corrected, were, were zero or, or one. And then, but kindergarten seemed high to me. Um, and again, home education as defined under the law is six through eight, ages six through 18, unless you're a disabled child by that definition, it could be three to 21. So I would guess, and, and maybe um, Jill and Mike have a better idea, most, Children in kindergarten, are they six years old? By kindergarten, I know some could be, but I I think so. I think they turn six and during that year. Okay. Yeah. So those numbers might be reasonable, but I just want to read because yeah. I receive requests from parents when their kids are four asking yeah. to be enrolled in home education. I actually had a, a, a new mother ask me about home education. And I <laughs> starting very early. <laughs> But I think that'll be part of that training I want to do with districts and, and the FAQs. Like, what do you do if you receive a request from a parent who has a four-year-old? Well, that doesn't, you can't enroll them in home education unless they're a disabled child, find a disabled child. Um, what I did with one family, because a district was asking them to um, enroll in home ed through my office, I said, I, and they were five, not to be six until February. I said, I can make the effective date the date of his sixth birthday and send you a letter today. And so we worked it out that way. But I was curious why the district was asking that question. But if, um, although that a disability status of a student may be requested, a family has no obligation yes. to provide that information. Correct. And I would say, okay. so in my office, I would say, then I cannot enroll you <laughs> because you haven't demonstrated that you qualify, right? If you're okay. only going to be six, unless you demonstrate that you're a disabled child, then I can't enroll you. Okay. Right. It would okay. be similar if they were out of state and wanted to enroll in New Hampshire, but they gave you a New York address. I'd be like, I can't enroll you in New Hampshire education because you're telling me you don't live here. You know, right. so, but at the same time, it's an issue. It's an issue. Right. I, I thought it through. I'm like, so that, how do right. you? ask that question? I mean, to me, like it's required at six, right? Yes. It doesn't, what's what's to really stop a, a family, you know, enrolling their child at five or four? I mean, as a mother of many children and, you know, knowing families who have many children, right? We just get busy throughout the day. If I know my next kid, I'm already homeschooling them in kindergarten, why not just go ahead and add them with the older sibling, right? Because I want to be in compliance, and what if I don't do it on their sixth birthday? You know, it's kind of like yeah. covering your bases, even though it's not required. 
Right. So I, because it's you're not it's the ages are six to eighteen under the law, but the definition okay. of a child. Okay. To be enrolled in home education. So if we want to expand the age, we could do that through law. But so I do have a this is April. I do have a clarifying question because as a mother of a child children with disabilities. What I'm hearing is if the child is three to six and they have a disability, they can be considered under compulsory attendance. Is it mandatory for children who have a disability to attend school from ages three to six? Oh, I don't believe so. Okay, so I don't know why, where, why there would be that distinction of disability on whether a child could be enrolled or not. Well, you said under the compulsory attendance law. Okay. I'm saying under the ED, the 193A, the definition okay. is six through 18, um, but and disabled, disabled, defined as disabled, which is a three year. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. So that's because I have the same question. Do we have a disconnect in the laws between compulsory attendance yeah. and the 193A definition of the child? Is okay. there a disconnect there? Okay. I, I need to map it out, but I think. But I think it'd be helpful for schools because again, I get and it, it's not necessarily children with disabilities that are sending me these that's a, five and four year old ones. It's just a parent who, like you said, well, I'm gonna do the older one, I might as well do the other one now. Right. I'm like, I can't take that right now. Okay. <laughs> but you know, and it's gonna affect accounts. And if those sure. accounts are important, then I want to make sure they're right and they adhere to the law. That's all. Okay. So thank you. Um, and that was all I had, I believe. So again, these counts are available online. Um, I may in the future look to do some, just graph some stuff up just to get, maybe present to the council some of the history. There was definitely a spike in 2021. So see the count went down for this year. It went down slightly, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, this is April again. What does it take to have the title of a report changed. For example, I think it's a great idea to change the title to home education versus homeschooled. What does that process look like? So I've already made that request of our data team. So they put it okay. in help, what's called the help desk ticket. Okay. And it'll get thrown in the queue of their work. And is there any estimated timeline? They haven't them? provided one yet. Okay. I just, so when I was printing this out on Wednesday, I went through them and I noticed there's also an, an error on one of the reports I got it fixed on um, the district counts, I believe. So at the last page of district counts, we've updated the law, which, had, which I think was updated several iterations ago, where, but it's not updated on the very last page. Um, you'll see you need 31505 duties of participating agencies. I think this is an old rule where they had to keep a list of the name, date of birth, and address of each child. That was changed okay. a couple, two iterations ago in the law okay. and rules. They only have to keep a count or the name. So again, I, I was able to change it one, didn't notice it until I got this report printed out. So it's a constant looking at these little things, right, that the state and government will try to keep up with these changes. So the law changed. Uh, now I've got to figure out all the places I need to go and Update Thank you for your attention to detail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's great. Any questions or comments about the uh, Department of Education report? No, I, it's like, Mike. I just wanted to say, I think the problem with the uh, special education students is the identification process. So if you have a student with learning disabilities at home, you're just going to work with those. <clears throat> if they're in a preschool, they're going to be identified and get tested and then notified. And so the, the process of classifying the student, I think, is where the confusion comes in. Yeah. Okay. In, in terms of reporting. And this may be an issue. Yeah. The, again, Tim, again, so this may be an issue for another meeting, but child fine, um, yeah. when, you know, the districts are responsible for child fine. So I deal with this with the non-public schools as yeah. well. Is how are districts doing that? How are they communicating that to all the uh, populations they're supposed to? And I know some districts do a great job. I know some districts don't do a great job. And it's so maybe that's a conversation that would be helpful to how are how is 
the district child fine connecting with the home education community. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So that might be something you can I can bring forward to the council at a later meeting. Thank you. Okay. Hearing uh, nothing more about the updates from the New Hampshire Department of Education. We'll move on to member reports. Uh, at this time, 8A, we do not have any legislators present. Um, we did get the update from Representative Pedernell. Senator Ward did give us some information earlier. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on to 8B, Home Educator Association Representatives. So we'll start with Althea. Althea, do you have any anything for us? Um, uh, we continue to get um, the same sort of uh, standard kinds of questions. Um, we are going through the process of updating our website, so I can certainly empathize with uh, others who are going through that process. It's very, very hard, um, but it's a good process to go through. Um, and um, I think that's it. Diane? Most of what I dealt with was HB 628 yeah. and the concerns. Yeah. So um, this is April. CUHG continues to see families who uh, definitely have an interest in home educating their children and definitely seeing an increase of people wanting to get together in person um, that element that many of us did not have for a couple of years because of the pandemic. So it's nice to see families coming back together, trying to reach out and uh, get together. So that's really great. Um, okay, how about uh, 8C, Home Education Community? Rebecca? I think uh, just quite a lot of questions about the bill, 628. Okay. A lot of people. Mike? Yeah, nothing to add to that. Okay. All right. And 8D, uh, New Hampshire School Administration Association. Ms. Barker is absent, so we're unable to hear from her. Uh, we miss you, Heather. Um, 8E, Non-Public School Advisory Council. Jill, do you have anything for us? No, we have not yet had a meeting since the last time um, we met. Um, so there have been the last HEAC meeting and then this one, and then actually um, the week after Thanksgiving is our next um, um, non-public school advisory council meeting. And um, I'll definitely fill them in on our conversation about HB 628. Thank you, Jill. Um, and then we're going to move to uh, 9A, which we added continuing business notification requirements. Mike, would you take it away? Yes. So um, Tim brought up uh, an issue, but homes, educating family or ends their program and uses the Department of Ed as their, uh, thank you, just, <laughs> just vacated my mind. <laughs> School districts get concerned because they no longer know where the child is. And it's, it's become an issue because of recent events where um, Department of Health and Human Services were looking for children that were supposed to be in public school. They had gone and left the public school, and there was no more information other than they had left the public school. And uh, so I don't know if there's a solution to this, because uh, as Tim informed us and through the attorneys, that student's information is private and not allowed to be shared by anybody. Um, but it is, it, it might be nice to encourage folks to let their home district to know yeah. that they've re removed themselves from the home education program and the students no longer being home educated, just as a courtesy to a local school district. If you've never been associated with a local school district, there's no sense to inform them. Right. But if you were enrolled there at one point and removed yourself, but used a non-public school or the department, as a participating agency, it might be a nice courtesy to the let the district know. And I, I think um, just to echo what Mike is saying, so there's two steps in the ED-315. There's you have to notify of withdrawal, and then you have to do your home intent to home educate. 
notification to right. one of three participating agencies. The calls I've been getting from districts has been uh, the parent informed us that they were withdrawing their child and they're home educated. And then the school is very concerned that they did not get the notification of intent to home educate. And they said, we <clears throat> want that information. And I had to say, I checked with our attorney because I've got a number of calls about this in the last six months or so. <laughs> and this it's that student level data. There's nothing in the law or rule that says we have the ability to share that information. So you cannot share that. What I do tell superintendents is, under the law, we are required to issue a, or acknowledge receipt of that letter. We do that by a formal letter attachment to an email, or if I don't have their email, it goes out in the snail mail. And I inform the superintendent, if that parent notified through us, they would have a letter from us within the stipulated 14 day period under the law. The district, if they so chose, could go ask for a copy of that letter. And that's the parent's protection, basically, right? If the truant officer shows up, mm -hmm. they can say, we hope it doesn't get there. And I've worked with families and I've asked them this one situation. I said, I had their email. They said, district's very concerned. If you give me authorization, I can simply tell them that you've notified with us. And I never heard from the parent. So my hands were tied because I'm not going to violate that parent's trust. And so, but there is this concern and, and some of these, Folks get quite upset and maybe rightfully so in certain situations. Um, so it's just it's something that's come up. I think it would probably take a change in law, okay. perhaps to yeah, if, I'm not if sure it wanted to be addressed. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. But but I just wanted to share that and my yeah. being in the school district, Heather would probably be able to shed light on maybe how the thinking is in the district sometimes about that. Sure. Um, I think Jill had her hand up. Oh, I don't know I'm sorry. Yeah. Your thought. Oh, oh no? Okay. okay, sorry about that, Jill. Um, this is April. On the flip side of that, as a parent, I've encountered parents having this, and I've encountered it in my own uh, experience, where um, I my children were enrolled in a public school. Um, I contacted before disenrolling my child. I became a member of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association. Um, I did provide notice of withdrawal in writing, and Home, the Homeschool uh, Legal Defense Association recommends that parents use non-public schools as their participating agency. Yes. Now, here's the thing that I felt like was an overreach. I had already provided, the, I was withdrawing my child. The school district knew that. Now I get an email saying, the superintendent has not received your notification to homeschool or home educate, Ooh. to which my email said, according to ED315, I am not required to use the local school district as my participating agency. I did not disclose who we used. As a homeschool parent, I certainly felt like that was an overreach. Um, they're not entitled to that information about my child. And I've also talked to other parents who you've left this school district, you've notified them, and the districts continue to reach out and it's unwanted by many parents. Yes. So I don't know where we find that middle yeah. ground. Yes. Yeah. But it's not the local school district's mm -hmm. responsibility yeah. to find out yeah. where we have yeah. notified and chose to yes. use as a yes. participating agency. Right. It, the only the, and, and the twist is that um, if if something were to happen to a child that used to be enrolled and the district says, I don't know what happened to that child. They look on it, the district looks uninformed in it, and as if they haven't taken the care through a, a careful process. Yes. And I'm not saying that you have any responsibility to the district. Right. I'm just right. trying to give you the district mm -hmm. perspective on that. Right. But what responsibility does a district have besides child find once a school a child is withdrawn from their school? Yeah, there there is none. Okay. Right. But if if and, and it was this terrible situation where the, the child was an unknown whereabouts. Um, the district was the last known place, and they said, we don't know. We didn't follow through. We don't know where they landed. Um, and so that's why that may explain some of the overreach of districts wanting to know. Right. It, it can yeah. come across feeling coercive, like you're sure. trying to yeah. 
we're right. trying to um, kind of um, encourage you to choose us as your participating agency when a parent may no longer want to be associated right. with right. the That's district. Right. Yes. So yeah. I don't. Yeah, I see it as the parent's responsibility and it's their choice yes. as to where they and go for a participating compulsory attendance that law is on the parent. Yes. So that it's a good point. That. I think from the district standpoint, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you withdraw your child from a district to go to one of the other compulsory attendance required pathways, the only one that can't be followed up on is home education. EFA can be followed right. up on, public schools can be yes. followed up on, public yeah. schools, right. and yes. they can all be followed up on. So yes. that's why I think there's some maybe discomfort from the district level. Right. Is, but again, our office, so you're all aware, is we do not share that information. And again, I've shared with my we I've had some very tense conversations with some attendants, unfortunately. Right. Um, but uh, I just wanted to, I thought this council should be kind of aware of those calls that are being received mm -hmm. by the department in that regard. So I'm just curious for the sake of conversation, um, if a child is withdrawn and there's a contact from the district to ask the parent who hasn't chosen the district as a participating mm -hmm. agency, you know, is there somewhere you would like us to send the child's records? Right, because a, a lot of times if you're transferring to another yes. school, there's a records request to send this child, yes. child's records. And then yeah. I'm assuming that district is no longer the custodian of the child's records. I don't know how that works, they, they but is that a way to get away, like around it? So you're not necessarily. No, I, I don't, okay. there's no obligation to explain where the child went. I think in, in my mind, it would just be a courtesy to say we've chosen another pathway for our child's education. You know, without saying I've chosen this private school or department of ed or, or any specific, um, just communicating, we, we, we're drawing our child, we're home educating, and we've chosen another entity to be the, the participating agency. And I, I just, I think that would help ease some of the concerns. It doesn't give the district more information, um, but it's not crickets and no response. And, and so it, it might take away some of the, some of the uh, fears of something bad happening uh, but it's it it's just a suggestion it's not, right. not a requirement or anybody's responsibility to, to do that but if a parent should feel comfortable to do that yeah and it would be welcomed information I, to I a district so. yes okay mm -hmm. yeah. madam oh. chair i just want to yes, let you know we've passed uh, 4 30. oh thank you very much <laughs> for that um, we have indeed passed 4.30, and it's 4.36 now. Thank you, Althea. Um, we agreed to only meet to 4.30. Is there anyone who would like to make a motion that we continue um, on? We do have something that does need action. We do need to establish a grievance committee because we do have an obligation to do that. I'll make a motion that we carry on to finish part A of new business. I second it. Okay, Mike. And Rebecca's a second. Okay. I have a hard stop at five o'clock. Thank you, Joan. Any other comments, discussion? Hearing none on a roll call vote. Uh, Diane. Yes. Rebecca. Yes. Althea. Yes. Jill. Yes. Mike. Yeah. And I'm a yes. And that is to continue with the meeting up to 5A. Okay. Uh, any any other discussion about 9A notification requirements? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to 10A, the establishment of a grievance committee. Um, the chair is required to appoint a grievance committee as outlined in ED 315.12. Uh, it can be no more than five members and the majority um, 
are to be representative of the home education associations. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious who is interested in serving on this committee. Maybe we have um, three people so that there's a simple majority. So first, does anyone have any interest in serving on the grievance committee? I'll serve on the grievance committee. Thank you, Diane. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. How many, how many uh, times has there been need to use the grievance committee in the last few years? Mm -hmm. There's been nothing come before the grievance committee in the past few years. Mm -hmm. I did have a conversation with a former council member um, and it was mentioned to me that it has been a very long time before something has come before. Well, that's a good thing. The grievance committee. Um, however, we still have an obligation to form one should a need arise. Got to be ready. Anyone else interested? I, I Mike? Okay. Um, I am also willing to serve on the grievance committee. Can I make a suggestion? Absolutely. I see that the grievance committee, uh, we only have so many candidates. Correct. I say that it should be an odd number of people on that meeting committee. I agree. For voting purposes or okay, just a thought. I think in um, in good faith, it would be nice to have a chairperson who is from a home education association to serve uh, as the chair. And I do have to appoint a chairperson for the grievance conference. And since I'm gonna come out, yeah, it's not like you, Diane. <laughs> so I'm gonna put the question on you. Would you be willing to serve as the chair of the grievance? Sounds like a great plan. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, with that, um, since I have the duty to appoint the grievance committee, I uh, would like to appoint uh, Diane as chair, Mike as a member, and myself as a member. Any discussion or concerns about that? Hearing none, I just want to thank you guys for volunteering to be on the, the grievance committee. Okay, so we did complete 10A. Um, before I take a motion to adjourn, I just want to remind you that our next scheduled meetings are December 15th, if needed, and January 19th. Um, and with that, may I please have a motion to adjourn the meeting? A motion to adjourn the meeting. Okay, Rebecca? I'll second. second. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion on the motion to adjourn? Hearing none, we'll go on a roll call vote. Rebecca? Yes. Althea? Yes, okay. Jill? Yes. Thank you. Mike? Yes. Diane? Yes. And I'm a yes. So with that, we will adjourn the meeting at 4.42. Oh, and I'm being prompted to use the gavel. This is not a, the meeting is adjourned. Excellent. I just bought it for you guys. You're so sweet. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank Have you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. You Thank too. You. Thank you. Yeah, I hope we don't. <laughs>